Hello everyone and uh, welcome to the Code for Lib Lightning Talks. Uh, this is the third round for the third day. Uh, just as a quick note, the Lightning Talk chat and Q&A will all be in the same session for Whova. Uh, it won't be uh, jumping around like some of the other talks have been. Um, <clears throat> If you have a question for any of the Lightning Talk presenters, please enter the presenter's first or last name in your question. They'll be presenting live, so probably won't be able to address your questions later until the presentation is over. Uh, we've got a lot of presenters and I'm looking forward to this. Uh, forward to this. Uh, so we'll start off with our first presenter, which is Carrie Gordon on using OBS, the free and open source video production. Hi, I'm Kerry Gordon, and uh, I'm going to give you a very quick overview of OBS, uh, the video mixer that is free and open source. Uh, this has got to be quick, so here we are. OBS, as I said, is free. It's available online from obsproject.com. Uh, it started uh, a few years ago, and it was a simple product, and for years I didn't use it because it was too simple for what I needed, but uh, I've rediscovered it, and it's become a complete product that's competitive with, I think, anything else on the market. And how did it get so big and be free? Uh, well, it's had some good supporters like YouTube and Facebook who have put a lot of money into it because they want people to generate good contact content to put on their platforms. The OBS site has a lot of sources of help and it has a great studio overview that lets you uh, helps you get started in setting it up. I'll admit that I really didn't look at any of this when I started. I just dove into it and I really had no problems at all. So this is what you see, or this is one version of what you see when you open OBS. Uh, it, uh, it is pretty complete right on the face of it. This is a typical view and a pretty stock view where you have a preview panel and a uh, production panel. So I just switch from the bars to myself in production. We're not using this here because that makes it too confusing. But it works on, like many video switchers, it has scenes. So right now, this is the, uh, my Code for Live uh, scene. I have a Zoom scene. I have some things I used in a presentation earlier. So anyway, and you can just cut between them. You can fade. There are other transitions as well. Oh, you can also add them as you want. Just create a new scene. Okay, and then you can add things to it. Uh, you probably want to add, we'll add the video capture device. We'll add the existing one. There I am again. I usually add the audio input so that you don't need this for the kinds of, for Zoom meetings where you're using this as a camera, but it's very helpful if you're recording things. So anyway, we just created uh, we just created a new scene. So anyway, back to what we were looking at. The scenes that I have. So the reason I got started is because I was in a meeting with Peter Murray, and uh, Peter had a very nice index data logo in the corner of his screen. And I said, "How do you get that?" And he said, "OBS." So I did the same thing, essentially just took this, this scene is, I have the Cherry Hill Company logo, I have my video, which I've adjusted in size to make my head bigger, although it really doesn't need to be, and I put it together and it was OBS demo, there you go. So in this one, I have the sponsor background here, and then I've inset my video up here. So you can make the video any size you want, you can insert, you can crop it, very easy. Moving on, uh, as you see, here's the audio mixer section. We don't really use that much. And on this side are the controls. And the controls are great. Streaming, recording, 
virtual camera, which is what I use for Zoom, and settings. It's really nice to have the settings here. So these are the settings panels. I've pretty much used most of this just as it came out of the box. Uh, the only thing I changed, I changed the preview because uh, so, I like to have the overflow visible so I can adjust it as I need it. It may, just makes it a little easier for me. Going to the stream panel, it supports a lot of streaming things, but the ones that come up stock are the sponsors, Facebook, YouTube, etc., Twitter. So also, though, if you go to show all, you get this long list, and I believe you can set up something that's not in there if you want. Output, I haven't really changed, uh, I except for I made the recording format MOV. Audio, I switched to mono, and this is one of those settings, if you change it, you have to restart the program, but I switch it to mono because this is my mic and it's mono. Uh, video, I didn't uh, touch other, you know, Canvas is 1920 by 1080, which I found is best for Zoom. Hotkeys, I would definitely set up if I was doing this in production. In advance, that's too advanced for me. So that's pretty much it. I know there's a lot of stuff here. It looks overwhelming, but it actually is quite simple. All right. Well, that was a great talk. Our next talk is coming up from Kevin uh, Konchansky, uh, Haiku in Evolution. Thank you. Let me get this in presenter mode. So my name is Kevin Kochanski. I'm client liaison at Notch8. We are a Ruby on Rails consultancy and Sambera service provider. And a uh, quick introduction on Haiku. There's a lot going on with it in 2021. So I wanted to give folks an update. Um, for those who might come in off the street, Haiku is a Sambera solution bundle. Since Sambera is kind of a loose set of components, Haiku make that into a more turnkey applicate, repository application for users. Uh, and a lot of um, great features from Hyrax, including faceted, robust search and browse and universal viewer support, mediated deposit workflow and embargoes and leases, but also adds the key, the kind of marquee feature is multi-tenancy, which allows one instance of Haiku to host multiple discrete repositories. Um, it also has some other items like uh, more pre-built work types and a pre-installed bulk import export gem called Bulkrax. The biggest news this year or recently this past month is that Haiku 3.0 was released. That bumps everything up to Hyrax 2.9. Now Hyrax 3 was just released this week. So uh, we'll be working on updating Haiku to that as well. But 3.0 release uh, is Hyrax 2.9 and also updates Rails and Ruby. Um, that import export is now behind a feature flipper so it can be used at the per tenant level. And the contact us email workflow is uh, customizable at the tenant level, which is the, the true discrete nature allowing multiple institutions to use one instance of the software. Uh, other improvements include theming improvements. Um, I've been on more on that that's in the works later. Um, and uh, go and lease now um, can auto release uh, using background jobs. Um, bulk racks I mentioned is the easy to use interface that you're able to create, edit, delete, run and rerun imports. And it supports a variety of formats, including OAI, PMH, CSV, XML and Bagot. Um, as I mentioned, it's now optional in Hyrax 3.0 at the per tenant level. And the big news is that there's a lot of grant projects going on in Haiku and in the pipeline. So advancing Haiku um, is pretty big in the community. Uh, Arcadia Charitable Fund, Bird Library, University of Virginia, and Ubiquity Press. They've recently uh, conducted a community survey to make sure that what they're doing is in alignment with other major Haiku projects. And some of the features they've worked on is DOI minting, ORCID integration, and they contributed the embargo and lease auto release feature to Haiku 3.0. You can follow their activity at advancinghaiku.io. Haiku for Consortia 
is a collaboration between two library consortia, Palni and Palsi, along with Notch 8. This uses the tenant approach uh, for consortial members to have repositories with one instance of the software, the Haiku for consortia. Uh, there's collaborative workflow developments that will be contributed back to the open source. And um, they're currently working on multiple theming templates that's really gonna expand use cases for Haiku. And this is a peek at that. There's uh, three, uh, right now Haiku out of the box is very um, kind of focused, but they are, broadening the use cases by introducing these theme templates that you'll be able to pick um, from a really easy to use uh, admin dashboard. And what we have a peek at the cultural repository theme. They're also working on a proposal for an IMLS grant for additional work that will be across three years, incorporating a lot of feedback, but they expect on that roadmap to include uh, more work on uh, flexible metadata, accessibility enhancements, and better file handling, as well as working on their own business model for the consumer. Other projects in development for Haiku are the National Transportation Library with the um, Department of Transportation and Notch 8. The Shared Research Repository, which is currently live, that was between the British Library and Ubiquity Press, and they are entering, about to enter a new phase of work in 2021 and the Newman Numismatic Portal between Washington University and St. Louis and Notch 8. There's also hosted service solutions out there for Haiku repositories. Ubiquity Press has U repositories and Notch 8 offers Haiku up. And there's always a lot going on with Haiku. So I invite you to follow us, haiku.sanvera.org is an informational site that gets updated. We've got our own Slack channel in the Sanvera Slack. There's a Google group that you can sign up for updates with. And uh, most importantly, the last Thursday of every month is the Haiku interest group. So if that interests you, you missed one today, but there'll be another one at the end of April. And we get updates of all these projects that are going on and get to get some user feedback about people that might be interested in adopting Haiku as a platform. Thank you for listening. And I uh, hope everybody had a great Code for Lib 2021. All right. Well, that was a great talk as well. We have a next talk from Ken Irwin, Circulating Software Licenses on Demand. Hi, good morning, everybody, or afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I'm going to talk about a project that we've been working at at Miami University for the last year or so. Uh, it, let's see, present. Uh, uh, it, it's something that we had been starting to work on before the pandemic, and then it um, increased in importance once we no longer had students on campus. We were working on a plan to start distributing software licenses uh, electronically so that you can borrow uh, what we started with was Adobe licenses and uh, use on your computer in your dorm, in your home, in Siberia, uh, wherever you have an internet connection to get access to uh, a software license that you don't own yourself, that the university owns um, and can uh, distribute for a short time. And so the, the change here came from a move from the old world in which we had device-based uh, user licensing. I, I believe I have a typo on this slide. Uh, device-based licenses where you would uh, ha have one, lic one license per device. And if you wanted to use that license, you had to go sit down at that device. And so that meant that uh, we, we had a computer lab that had Adobe software on it. And if you wanted to use Adobe software that you didn't own, you had to come to the computer lab. Um, yeah, both of those slides say user-based licensing. That's great. Um, the new model is uh, user-based licenses where you can say, Ken has access to the Adobe software for now. And uh, that is something that we can grant and revoke more or less at will. And so we do that through Adobe's user management portal. And so there's an API that lets us say, um, we have this cluster of licenses for students, we have this cluster of licenses for staff, and we can assign them in real time and revoke them in real time. What we did with this project was we mashed that up with LibCal, which is the software that we use for doing things like room reservations. If you wanna check out a study room, um, 
you can sign up for a time and it sets you an allotted amount of time. And then when it's done, um, your reservation is over. And so we applied that same model. You can reserve software, the, the, the Adobe software in LibCal, say, I would like to use this for three days, for a week, and you can check it out for that duration. And then we use that LibCal system to uh, guide how we uh, allot licenses in Adobe. And so here is my complex diagram. The user goes and talks to LibCal and says, I want to borrow some Adobe software. Um, the software checkout app that we wrote that sits in the middle, uh, every 15 minutes pulls an update from LibCal to say who ought to have access to this right now. And then calls up Adobe and says, who do you think ought to have access to this right now? And it looks for discrepancies. And then uh, any updates that happen there, it compares those lists. Anybody who is newly added to the LibCal list who ought to also now have access to the Adobe software, it sends back up to Adobe. And anybody whose time is up, that also information also gets sent up to Adobe. And so it updates our licenses. And then in the space of 15 or 20 minutes between when the user said, I wanna use this software right now, uh, they get an email from Adobe saying, hey, you have access to this now. Um, and so this has been a really popular service. Uh, I think we have a hundred licenses allocated for use with our students that way. And it's pretty frequent that we have maybe 75 of them in use at a time. I think we're still hoping that there will come a time when we get closer to the threshold of really having all of our licenses in use. Um, but we're looking at this as a more efficient way to allocate licenses, both an easier way for students to get access to them and for us to control how many licenses we need. Uh, and so we're excited about this possibility. And um, we're excited about where we can go with it in the future. Uh, partially because of the pandemic, what was be, our, our proof of concept app pretty much got rolled out as our production app. And uh, there are some things about it that could be a little cleaner. I think our first step before we do anything else is to do a little refactoring. Uh, but then we're gonna be looking at adding more apps. Uh, we're gonna be looking at checking out Apple licenses, Google software licenses, uh, anything that's going to let us allocate our licenses by um, by API is really susceptible to this approach. And so that's what we're going to be aiming to do. Um, we have a, a GitHub project. I wouldn't call it like release ready, but if this is something that you're interested in, I would definitely be interested in either hearing from you. You can check it out, um, take a look. It, it is definitely, we are right at the beginning of, of a planned refactoring process. So it's it's going to change before uh, we add anything new to it. It's a little bit uh, clunky for thinking about adding a second or third product to it. Um, but if you are doing anything like this, I'd love to hear from you. Or if you want to do something like this, I would also love to hear from you. And um, I hope that this can be of use to somebody else. I, hope, I think this might be part of the way of the future. Thank you all. All right. Uh, just as a reminder to have fun, the Q&A in Whova can be used to ask questions for the presenters. Uh, our next speaker is Julia Caffrey-Hill, Unsolvable, Unsolvable Alone, eResources and the Web. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for the introduction there. So this is my first uh, Code for Lib national conference, and it's been really exciting. I'll be back. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about e-resource accessibility, accessibility, or rather inaccessibility, um, and how it's more, it's more achievable to get to accessibility together. Um, and in my library, I wanted to share a little bit about our story. Uh, when we did our first uh, audit for web accessibility across platforms, um, the e-resource specialist at the time said, let's just not include e-resources. There are too many databases and too many vendors. Um, and I think that was in response to how in-depth our methodology was for checking for web accessibility. And so as a result of that, I really wanted to get some of these techniques, methods, and um, knowledge and awareness in front of people who work with e-resources every day. 
So I went to Charleston conference in 2019 and presented a workshop on how to identify user experience and accessibility issues. Um, there, I saw a great presentation uh, where Courtney McAllister included a slide that had a framework on how to uh, scale up web accessibility and check for it on e-resources. So way more scalable. And they were doing it at Yale Law. And I think the framework came from somewhere else originally too. Uh, Rob Plesher, who is our current e-resources specialist uh, and very interested in accessibility, turned to me and said, let's do this. We can do this. So in 2020, we did an initial audit of our e-resources. And it really took many people across the team to achieve that. So I did the training and I wasn't alone in that. I had support from our university's accessibility analyst um, who is certified. Um, and we had Rob's knowledge and special specialty in gathering the VPATs from the vendors and working with them. Our residency librarian did the bulk of the work with testing, developing a ru rubric, analyzing and presenting results. And um, we're in the process now as a, it, at a committee level and working with administrators to write letters and send out results and thinking about how to share our data. Um, we've done work as a library on um, how to identify what is in our direct control, where we contribute, and how we influence web accessibility and where we have no influence. I think that's really important to do across an organization without, um, otherwise I think it can be really imbalanced with one feeling like it's their job alone and everyone else feeling like um, it's not my problem. So um, a good example of um, how at a project or at a organizational level we might map um, responsibility is from the International Association of Accessibility Professionals. They've mapped all of WCAG 2.x to project roles in software. And spoiler alert, it's not just web designers and developers who are solely responsible for doing it. Um, so I'm wondering how can we map accessibility to roles in libraries and archives and with vendors and publishers? And how can we work together to get further than if we were alone? Um, so I think as an industry and at a professional level, it takes a village and we need to make room at our table. We position ourselves as the sole expert on it. People are gonna assume that we're territorial about it or that um, it's, it's our job. So we need to cross train each other and publish our e-resource testing frameworks. I've seen great things in Code for Lib Journal and I really want to connect about that. Um, and we need to cross pollinate hopefully in other conferences in resource sharing and archives and all those other great places in library land. Um, so if you're interested, I'm really interested to um, continue this conversation and um, I have some references that link out to this that I'll be uploading um, to OSF with the slides. And thank you from me and from my cat, Athena. All right. Uh, our next speaker is Jacob Voss with the decomposition of DDC synthesized numbers. Yeah, hello, thank you. I'd like to share some results of a project of a colleague of mine. She's working on DDC numbers for many years. I think you all know DDC, it's used in more than 138 countries uh, since a century. Um, yeah, it's hi a hierarchy with 10 main classes and there are these uh, DDC add tables to build new numbers. And this is something special, it's, it's a faceted classification. And some of the built numbers are already in the schedules to look up, but others have to be built with knowledge of the DDC. And the point is, yeah, this is very a powerful system, but, or I first sh show an example here, um, 
a, a longer number. It's if you have a book about art or a, co a collection. Um, and this is uh, built from a table with a year, 1940, 1949, and museums, collection exhibits in, the, in New York. So in the New York metropolitan area, there was um, a museum that had a collection or um, exhibition with arts from this period. And the catalog of this um, exhibition gets this long number. Yeah, fine, but um, if you only have these numbers, how to get to these uh, elements? And it turns out the building rules are very sophisticated and there's no easy way uh, back to classes contained in the synthesized um, CDC number. There were some att attempts uh, with a, a PhD thesis in library science in 1993, but after this, um, it took many years and now we can finally show uh, some uh, results of the project conducted at, at BCG. And um, yeah, that's it, a uh, web interface and an API uh, to look up elements of a DVDC number or to uh, get an element and, and see where it, uh, it is used. And um, best uh, show it uh, live here. So we have a project page and then you can, uh, with documentation, then you can start it and if I take this uh, number, um, I get a very detailed view with all the hierarchy and the elements in there. And um, unfortunately, the labels are only available in German because of license. So the DDC would be much, much more useful if there was a free license, but only the European translations have a uh, Creative Commons license. So we show here in German now. Um, yeah. And the, the use of, of this, this analysis, if I have uh, the CDC number, I can look up that it's about uh, something in New York, for instance, or it's something in a specific uh, play, um, time period in the 20th century. And I, yeah, I could also look up, uh, given this, um, or given here New York, what other classes are built with New York in it. And uh, this database only contains around 12,000 uh, numbers by now, so there are only six, but in, in, in WorldCat there, there are probably much more uh, classes from a lot of different domains uh, with some um, parts of it about New York. And so, yeah, you are invited to, to play around with this and uh, we are happy for feedback or uh, collaboration uh, to make use of this. Uh, yeah, the first application would be information retrieval but um, it, yeah, it, it is a lot of work to, to uh, reanalyze this uh, DBC building rules also because they changed over the years. I can show another examples I found quite funny. So there's a number in astrology um, about interior decoration. So uh, yeah, if you want to know something about interior decoration, you wouldn't look up in philosophy, but you can combine everything in the Dewey system. Thank you. All right. Well, we have another talk uh, that is from Julia Corin, Triple IF, Full Text Search, and Hit Highlighting. Oh my. Hi, everybody. Um, I am Julia Corin. Uh, I am actually the university archivist at Carnegie Mellon, uh, so not I'm library tech adjacent. Um, and this is actually not the talk I'm going to give after all. Um, so I was planning to talk about our uh, ongoing Islandora 8 migration at Carnegie Mellon, uh, particularly some lovely work that one of our developers, Chris Kellen, has been doing um, to create seamless full text search in Islandora 8. Um, if this is what you were hoping to hear about today, please feel free to find me on Slack or email me. Um, and I would be happy to connect everyone. But uh, I have honestly not been able to get Aaron White's lightning talk from yesterday out of my head. So I woke up this morning and did a new presentation. Um, so I am going to posit that if the 2000s were the golden age of digitization, then the 2020s could be the golden age of technical debt. Um, and I don't mean this in a bad way. I actually mean this in a good way. Um, I also am not really using the traditional um, software <laughs> definition of technical debt. I am talking about technical debt held by the objects that we curate 
um, in these various access systems. So to give you a little context, um, at Carnegie Mellon, we have passed our 25th anniversary for our first digital collection. Uh, we are currently embarking in our third full system migration. So we've been doing this for a while. Um, we have over 750,000 separate objects in our digital collection system. So we have a lot of technical debt. Um, we have, you know, really racked that up. Um, and as you may be able to see from these numbers, um, we are a small shop, but we were a very bulk uh, scanning oriented shop. Uh, uh, Julia, our, yes, the, uh, the uh, video seems to have been lost. There's just a white line coming through. Oh, crikey. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Zoom, thank you for letting me know. Um, if it happens again, let me know. Um, so uh, we are, we're a very bulk oriented digitization shop. Um, we were assessed based on how many scans we could produce in a year, not kind of what the, the end point collection would look like. Um, let's see, no, nothing's in the right place anymore. Um, and as Aaron mentioned, um, funding has dried up over the years. Our first digital project was extremely well funded. It was a real showpiece. Um, our funding, even our funded collections have had less over time now to we don't really get funded digitization projects at all. Um, and the quality of those collections has in some ways, you know, gone down commensurately um, with the lack of funding. So, uh, ooh, oh, this is a disaster. Um, we uh, also have not invested, invested in metadata over time. There was a hope that, you know, technology would be a magic bullet and it would solve all our access problems um, without us having to put the work in. Spoiler alert, there are no magic bullets. This is not a good kitchen tool. Um, so I, I think at Carnegie Mellon and at other places, we have really focused on creating new content at the expense of curating our existing content. Um, Digitiz this, this approach is not sustainable. All we are doing is racking up technical debt and creating problems down the road. Um, and at Carnegie Mellon, our chickens have come home to roost as part of this Islandora 8 migration, um, where we can really tell um, the, the problems that we have created over time. So I think uh, I am proposing that we need to get past the idea that digital projects are projects. They are not projects, they are not time bound. They do not finish. They may get, they may pause for a period of time, but they will always come back. I think as Mike Bolum brought up the other day, uh, metadata is never done. We have to keep back and working on it. Um, so if the model we have been following is not sustainable, what do we do? Um, I think we need to ask ourselves why we're doing this. What communities are we serving? How are they using our collections? Why are the collections we are digitizing the collections that we are digitizing? I think we need to reinvest what we have in what we have already created rather than just creating new content after new content. We need to future-proof our collections whenever possible. And we need to consider the long-term technical debt implications of our choices. So you may be saying, Julia, you have not actually talked that much about technical debt. Um, how does it come into play? So with COVID and remote work, I think we have all had the chance to stop scanning and refocus on the work we've done in the past. Um, and focus on the collections we already have. I think we have also been able to demonstrate through this work to our administrators that this work is worthwhile and important, whether it is something like normalizing your dates and converting them to EDTF so that they can be searchable. Uh, in our case, it is uh, deduping a lot of our files and locating our masters, and in some cases, decommissioning collections. So, I just wanna thank our amazing digitization team um, who have been fighting the good fight for a very long time. Uh, have, uh, I wanna give them credit for all the invisible labor that they have put into building our collections over time. I also want to give a shout out to collaborators on a project I've been working on uh, to develop a technical debt framework for archives, specifically digital archives. Um, hopefully more to come in that space soon. Um, that's really all I have to say, thanks guys. All right. Well, our next speaker is Tori Culler, who will be giving us the talk, the Library Technology Career Jumpstart Program. 
All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Tori Culler and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm an NC State University Libraries Fellow. I'm gonna be talking to you today about the Library Technology Career Jumpstart Program, which is a new offering from NC State University Libraries that is open to incoming as well as current library school students. So then, since this is a really short five minute lightning talk, I'm just gonna focus on giving the who, what, when, where, why of the Jumpstart Program starting with the what. The Jumpstart program is a free immersive week-long program that helps to position first-year library school students for a career in library technology upon graduation. And in terms of the why, we started this program um, after recognizing that recruiting for technical positions in libraries is often pretty difficult. This is something that we've seen at our own libraries and also something that we've heard from our colleagues at other college and university libraries as well. Um, and the reason for this is because students just have differential opportunities to build up their technical skills while they're in library school, and so we wanted to help fill the gap. In terms of the WHO, the first cohort was eight participants, and the program was overseen by five planning committee members, and we also received help from more than two dozen of our colleagues throughout the libraries. It was held for the first time August 3rd through the 7th, 2020, on Zoom, of course, where else? Um, though this program was originally scheduled as an in-person event, and we definitely faced a lot of challenges in taking this program online, but we also found a lot of um, affordances that we weren't anticipating in taking it online too. So one of the first things we did as a planning committee was come up with our guiding values and our objectives that we wanted to build into the structure. And so the things we came up with are that the Jumpstart program seeks to increase awareness of technology careers and libraries, increase diversity in this area of the profession, impart strategies for learning technical skills, provide concrete steps forward towards a career in library technology. We wanted participants to uh, come away with a welcoming and inclusive space where a diverse cohort could learn from each other. And we wanted to foster a community of professional and interpersonal support. And we met this, these objectives by building a program uh, with the following components. So there were, of course, technical workshops. We started day one with introduction to version control through Git and GitHub. On day two, we moved into an introduction to coding using Python and Twitter bots. We did some introduction to web development, as well as machine learning on day four as our stretch day. Um, and our workshop instructors met several times to make sure that all these workshops were introductory level appropriate and that they um, had some cohesion and flow between them. But in addition to the tech workshops, recognizing that we could only get so deep with those in a week, we also wanted to offer a variety of other opportunities. So we offered a series of panels, including career paths and a day in the life of a technology librarian. Um, so in these participants got to hear how professionals in library technology arrived at their current position, as well as get some um, insight into the day-to-day -day realities of these positions. We also had some technology showcase panels in which we highlighted some of the cool projects that our librarians get to work on that perhaps students can get to work on in their future careers. We offered a number of big picture sessions as well. So students got to hear from our library's HR about how to structure a resume and cover letter specifically for technical positions. And they got to participate in a Q&A session with libraries administrators where they were able to hear what they think the future of library technology holds. There was a mentorship component as well. Each participant was paired with a mentor in the libraries who was matched with them based on their interest they expressed in the interview process. They were able to meet with this mentor at least once during the program and at least once after the program was over as well. And then we put together an asynchronous content bundle that contained some of the things we had to cut from the synchronous portion of the program um, in moving it online. And so this was a bundle of content that we hoped participants would be able to refer back to when they were perhaps in the process of applying to their first jobs. So it included things like a glossary of technical terms, as well as a slide deck on how to um, curate your web presence and build up your technical portfolio. So we conducted some assessment as well. And one really exciting thing for us was that all seven participants who completed the post-program satisfaction survey strongly agreed that they would be likely to recommend this program to other LIS students. Um, and one participant expanded on their answer by saying that um, the workshops in the program were able to provide them with enough direction to identify their interest and continue later on their own. They really valued the mentorship and they planned on staying in touch. Um, and they were excited to see the program um, continue to expand in future years. We also conducted a series of six month follow up interviews to try to see what some of the long term impacts of the program might be on participants thinking and intentions to pursue careers in library technology. 
And um, this was something that one participant said when asked to describe the program in their own words. I don't think it's like a boot camp. It's more like a space to introduce students to this world of library technology so that they make better choices about what they want to learn and how they want to spend their time in grad school. And that was really great to hear because that was very much in line with um, how we were setting up the program and what we were thinking when we were first designing it. So in terms of what is next for the Jumpstart program, we are planning on offering it again, August 2nd through the 6th this year. Applications are now open. Students can visit the link presented on the slide to apply. And there's also information there about how to nominate a student to apply. If you work with some, a library school student or um, otherwise no library school students who you think would be a really great fit. Coming soon, we also have a framework or how to guide for planning this type of event at your own institutions. And we will be sure to post a link to that um, widely on Twitter and on our website once that's available. And we definitely welcome uh, questions, feedback, ideas about where we should take this program next. So please feel free to reach out to me. Um, email is probably the best way to do that. And my email is listed at the bottom of this slide. Um, and then I also just wanted to give a shout out to the rest of the planning committee. This program takes a lot of work and effort to see through and it couldn't be done without the rest of the planning committee. So shout out to Kevin, Natalia, Jennifer, and Robin. But that is it for me. All right, uh, just a quick announcement. We've got some extra time with some open slots. So we will be reserving space for folks to raise their hand if they wanna give a very last minute lightning talk or setting up some time for some Q&A. So if you do have any questions, feel free to uh, please put them up and we'll try to have some time to talk about them. Uh, meanwhile, we have Dr. Kate Dybel. Do I have a deal for you? Uh, you are muted. Hello everyone. I am still after an entire year of using Zoom, unable to properly set these things up. Let me just move things over. You should be seeing my slide presentation and I should be nice and over in the corner, theoretically. There we go. Oh, come on. Thank you, Zoom, for eating up my time. Glad we have some extra time. Oh, gosh. So, yeah, we'll just deal with that. Do I have a deal for you? The secrets of accessibility overlays, they don't want you to know. And of course you can see me because it's Trans Visibility Week starting uh, yesterday, I believe. So yes, I am actually not invisible for once. So have you wanted to put a stop to worrying about those pesky disabled users? Tired of accessibility complaints from the government? Yeah, sorry, you're not gonna see me, I'm invisible because it's being a pain. Uh, tired of accessibility complaints from the government? Want that horrible Kate person to stop talking about accessibility? Well, I have the solution for you. With just a small line of JavaScript and a large annual cache delivery, your accessibility problems can be solved. Just pay Accessibility, or EcoWeb, or AudioEye, or any other accessibility overlay. And you know what? You can join great institutions like Gallaudet University, the you know University for Deaf and Hard of Hearing People, the FCC Consumer Complaints Center, the United States Social Security Administration, and the Department of Health of the State of Louisiana, just to name a few. And I should mention that if you go to these sites and you don't see an accessibility overlay, good 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 news for you. Your privacy blocker and you know ad blocker is probably preventing it. And it's not like you'll get sued or anything. Not like people have written articles about getting, oh wait, uh, back in June, Adrian Roselli, one of the uh, one of the most active and powerful writers in, in accessibility advocacy, wrote an entire website, or, you know, entire article called Accessibility Will Get You Sued. And guess what? These overlays have been cited in recent uh, accessibility lawsuits. So just say no to accessibility overlays. You know, so an accessibility overlay is a third party JavaScript code that you add to a page that supposedly will tweak the front end code for a website to make the page compliant with WCAG 2.x. And if you tell me that a page is now compliant with WCAG 2.1, 2.2, I'm assuming that means 100%. 
And there are a lot of popular ones out there. Accessibility, Audio High. Equal Web has been offering a lot of free things to public libraries lately. So I'm really, really, you know, not happy with them, but a lot of other products out there. And, you know, a good example is the uh, Louisiana Department of Health. So I have a screenshot of their website here and there's a side tab called accessibility, which opens up the accessibility platform and you can play with this. It has things of like going, hey, let's turn on a seizure safe profile. It eliminates flashes and reduces color. That's just great. However, though, remember, you'd have to turn this feature on in case you actually have epilepsy. So while I'm in the middle of having my seizure, I can go over, click, do a few clicks and turn it on. <laughs> so yeah, guess what? This one's at work. And there are tons of problems with overlays. First of all, most accessibility testing software can only catch 25% of issues. So how can an automated overlay fix 100% of accessibility issues? These companies should be selling these super fancy testers that catch 100% of the issues. And we all know that AI automated, uh, automated descriptions are error free, right? We've enjoyed the transcriptions and captions, but also, you know, I remember a code for lib a year or two ago where a person was showing using AI to make image descriptions. And a lot of those image descriptions mentioned luggage for some reason. There were people standing around, but there was plenty of luggage. And of course, overlays push accessibility work onto the, oh, we'll work on it someday, which means never pile. And if the overlay solves it all, why should you fix your code? How are you gonna convince your devs to do this? Screen readers and other assistive technologies get blocked by these overlays. Accessibility will constantly remind a screen reader user that, hey, we have screen reader uh, functions that you can turn on. It says that about every two minutes. That's exactly what you wanna hear every single moment, right? And of course, now we get into some of the other fun things. I was like, hmm, what do the experts say on overlays? Well, you know, there was a survey just done in 2021 by WebAIM of web accessibility practitioners. 67% of them, two thirds found that web accessibility overlays were not effective. Only 3% found them very effective. And if you take that group of web accessibility practitioners, it only considered those who identify as having a disability the numbers get worse. 72% find overlays to not be very or not at all effective. And only 2% of disabled web accessibility practitioners find them effective. The stats are horrible. And of course, the experts continue to say more and more things here. So really, if somebody mentions an accessibility overlay to you about your library, your museum website, just say no. And there's tons and tons of things, particularly the overlay fact sheet which as of yesterday was signed by 318 accessibility advocates and continues to grow. It's a, it's a clearinghouse for all the information as to why these are bad. And overlays have been a horrible, you know, vendor attempt to take advantage of the need for accessibility during this pandemic. Just say no. If you don't say no to accessibility overlays, Fiona will find you. You know, she looks very scary there with half her, you know, face uh, covered in shadow and her yellow eyes uh, with her black and white markings looking really, really evil. So just say no to overlays. And, you know, if Fiona doesn't find you, I will. Toodles. All right. Uh, well, we have a uh, last minute uh, lightning talk from Jonathan Rockkind at the Science History Institute. So I'll try to give up control. Ah, oh, there. Zoom was hiding on me. Thanks. Uh, sorry. Do to do. This is literally last minute. So, we here at the Science History Institute have been spending some time lately on some. It, we have a digital collections app that we're looking at here, and we've added some custom features for our oral histories that are really custom fit to exactly what we have. So I'm, I'm just going to show you those. because I think they're cool, and I think they might get people's brains flowing, and I just like showing them off. So we have, people may have heard of OMS, the Oral History Metadata Synchronizer Project. So that, there's like a standard, it's sort of a thing where you can edit synchronized transcripts with audio. And um, um, oh, I got distracted by the things on my screen. Um, and normally people using ohms have, um, 
there's like a PHP app you can use to display it. But we wrote a custom app integrated into our Rails app, sort of a custom front end for the XML that Omus produces. So we, and we went with this sort of tab based interface here where it sort of can fit into better to our application, our custom features. So this is kind of the Ohms thing is you have this transcript that you can more specific go to different parts of it. And also from Ohms has a sort of table of contents where it gives you sections, you can go to different parts of it. But then we also integrate into it our downloads because we um, most of our stuff is open for various licenses, but we try to let people download almost everything. And we try to do that with the oral histories where we could. So we have a downloads tab where you can download um, the, our PDF transcript that we that our oral history program prepares. It's like an edited publication. Um, the interview segments, which this is like over an hour of interview with Linus Pauling. Some of our stuff is like 10 or 11 hours and it's a bunch of different segments. And this is downloading the original Arcful files, or you can download sort of the combined file. It's a little bit more space efficient. Um, and it's kind of cool. Oh yeah, and, and you can see we, we did this sort of cool thing here. I think it's cool with the sort of fixed nav bar thing with, with the um, sections. There's also this, oh, what Linus Pauling might be talking about. This was a feature the Ohms front end had, so we wanted to copy it, or you can like search in the transcript and go to different parts. You might want to be like, oh, I want to listen to this part of the transcript. And you can click there and we'll start playing it. Um, and I think sort of doing customized let us do very specific things for what we had, like the fact that we have separate audio segments and we want to tell people the published version doesn't always match the audio because we've edited it for publication to take out like ums or weird digressions or things. Um, there's other features I could show you. Well, okay, I'll show you one more thing. Um, oh, one thing I'll show you if I can make it work. We try to do everything looking good on mobile. So here, if we, let's use the Chrome simulation here to simulate a really small screen. And it still works pretty decently. You can like scroll, look at these other tabs, da, 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 et cetera. So I was pretty proud of that. A more specific dental college. Thank you, Linus. And then the other cool thing is some of our oral histories, you can't download right away. So we also did custom features for ones that, um, this is another oral history, the page looks completely different because there's no audio you can listen to online. Instead, you have to request access to get the audio. You can download a small, um, it's just sort of the table contents and title page and index, or you can request access. And in some cases you get files emailed to you right away. In some cases it has to be reviewed for your usage and stuff, depending on what the interview you wanted. But sort of another example of, um, I don't know, I think this worked really well because we really made the interface specifically for what our oral histories had, what features we had in our collection and, and such. In fact, sometimes it was a little bit overfit with this. Like we really try to fit in everything on the page we could in very specific parts, places. And sometimes we come up with a new feature and I was like, how does that fit into the UI? We already designed this specifically for the features we have. So we get a little bit tricky there, but in general, I think it turned out really cool. So that's all, thank you. All right. Well, thank you to Jonathan for that last minute lightning talk. Uh, we're a little early and we have a couple uh, Q&A questions that were asked. And I think this maybe is a chance to uh, bring them up. And just as a reminder to everyone, uh, there are questions you can put in the Q&A and the presenters can look in and answer them when they're done. Uh, we've got two so far that have not been answered. Um, the first one was for Tori Color, which was asking, thank you for speaking about the Jumpstart program. In addition to being free, I was wondering whether full or partial tuition remission is available to help students from underrepresented groups move into library careers. Um, so for our program, particularly when it was going to be in person, everything was going to be covered. So that includes um, that included travel, flights, everything. Um, so for this program in particular, that was the financial support we were able to offer. And we did that because we wanted to um, make this program as accessible as possible for people from underrepresented groups. Um, with it going online, um, we didn't have any of those cost considerations. Um, so that wasn't an issue there. Uh, thank you for answering that. 
Uh, we have another question that didn't have a name, but uh, from the timestamp, I believe was for Jonathan asking, how do you store and serve transcripts? Um, well, the PDF files are just on S3. The audio is also just on S3. The transcript, sort of synchronized transcript is just, I mean, the OMS tool exports XML that has sort of marked up transcript and we store that in Postgres and then display it in the browser. Not sure if that answered the question, but that's everything I could think of about storing and displaying things. Okay, uh, well, if there's a follow-up question, please feel free to post it in Whova to the uh, questioner. Other than that, I think that covers all the questions that had not yet been answered. Uh, please do remember you can uh, ask the questions and we've got our presenters looking there. Uh, that being said, I think people might enjoy a slightly longer break. So thank you to all of our Lightning Talk presenters. And uh, <clears throat> before I forget, I was asked the, to announce the community support volunteers for the second half of the day. Uh, Bobby Fox, uh, Bobby Fox, all one word in Slack. And Anne Marie uh, uh, Mesco uh, in Slack, Anne Marie. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. <laughs>